Hello, welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Our show this month is about meteorites. In the studio with me are my two guests. To my immediate left, Sandra Masika, and to my far left, Dave Lacko. Now, Sandra, you've done some work with NASA and meteors? Yes, from about 1996 through 2005 in California, I worked with NASA where we did meteor studies. And Dave, you have your own meteorite company? That's correct, Don. I, have Dejar, I own Dejar Meteorites. Uh, I participate in local rock and gem shows and astronomy events. Great. Well, I'm glad to have you both here in the studio with us today. Now, we're going to start out with a very basic question, and that is, where do meteorites come from? Sandra, can you uh, tell our viewers about that? Sure. Um, if you've ever seen a shooting star, you've seen a meteor. Because shooting stars, they're not stars at all, but they're pieces of debris as small as a grain of sand, or they can be huge boulder type size. And when the Earth is traveling through space, if it meets up with a piece of debris, it will the debris will hit the atmosphere, and the friction between the piece and the atmosphere will cause the atmosphere to flame up around the piece of debris. So as it's moving through the sky and the and the atmosphere is burning it looks like a flaming object or a shooting star and if it actually lands on the earth it's no longer a meteor but a meteorite and there's a relationship between comets um, actually there can be debris for any number of reasons but we have concentrations of debris in space where comets as they travel around the sun um, comets are basically dirty snowballs with lots of bits of dirt and ice and such. And as they're traveling around the sun, you've seen the tails. It's actually leaving d bits of debris in a ring around the sun, like a ring around your bathtub, <laughs> only a <laughs> ring of debris around the sun. And so then as Earth is traveling around the sun, if it intersects that place, that ring of debris around the sun, it will, there'll be a lot more debris there, and so we'll see meteors during that time. And there's several different known meteor showers. Uh, one of the biggest is the Perseids, which you see in August, and because the Earth travels around uh, in a uniform way, it meets that same intersection of the debris from a particular comet. And so in the mid-August mid is the Perseid meteor shower. Um, another big one is the Drachnids, which is in mid-October. Then the Leonids, which is in mid-November. And the Geminids in mid-December. And August is, the Perseids is a good one because it's nice and warm out to be able to go look for meteors. And people often ask, where do you look? And that's an easy answer. You just look up. Look up. Right. Now, I understand that really the best time to view a meteor shower is really after midnight towards morning? Right, because then the Earth is actually rotating or turning into the space. Into that debris field that right. we're traveling through in space. Um, any other ways that we can encounter meteors besides these uh, meteor showers? There's actually any time that there happens to be a random piece of debris in space. It could come from the uh, asteroid belt or uh, from could just any reason at all. You can see meteorites. If you're in good dark skies where there's not too much light pollution, you can see a meteorite, meteor. Meteor. Right. Yeah. And then when they land again, that's when they become the meteorite. Exactly. I think that, that confuses a lot of people, the difference between the two terms. Um, uh, Glad that you were able to clarify that for them. Okay. Anything else about the the origin of meteors? Well, there's a couple of different types. Maybe we'll talk about that as we get into the different types of meteorites. Actually, that's what we're going to move into next. There are basically four types of meteorites that uh, can be found. And uh, we're going to learn about those four types and also how they're formed. And Dave, what's the first type, the most common? The most common is your stony meteorites. They account for about 90% of all known meteorites. Um, they're probably the most primitive of them. Um, your stony meteorites are divided into two classes, your chondrites and your achondrites. 
And the difference between the two is the fact that your chondrites have a small grain or circular grain in there, and that's called a chondral. And the chondrals were formed, one of the current theories is during the solar nebula, um, when our sun was just forming, that these, it was a hot, gassy mixture, and they heated up very quickly, cooled very quickly. And I like using the analogy when you see the astronauts in space take their uh, orange juice and they squirt it to show everyone they're in no gravity. Uh, the basic shape is generally a spherical shape or a dog bone shape. And this is a natural tendency to be a circular shape. And your achondrites do not have these chondrals in the mixture, in the matrix. So that would be the basic difference between? The two in the chondrites. In the chondrites, which make up the, the stony. The stony meteorites, correct. Stony meteorites. Now the next one. Uh, Did we have a picture of one of those? The stony meteorite? Uh, like this is one example yeah. here. And there, and I think we have uh, one on the screen now. There we go. Right, right. Now, next up would be the irons. And uh, Sandra, what, what do we know about iron meteorites? Yeah, the iron nickel is the second most common of meteorites that we find on Earth, and that's only about 7.5%. The uh, stony meteorites is the most of them. Far actually. away, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an example of uh, a meteorite I have that's a Gibeon meteorite. and it's made of nickel iron and a few uh, some other trace elements mm -hmm. but and it, when you hold these many people you know find they seem very heavy cuz they're made out of nickel iron and you this one has been cut open and there's a there's a one side that looks sort of burnt and natural and then the, there's the straight sides that we see and you see this act almost like a crystal crystal structure or a pattern mm -hmm. inside on the surface of the meteorite I see we have and one, throughout the... had one up there on the screen to right. demonstrate that uh, crystalline structure. Right. And that is uh, actually almost like a fingerprint that where uh, any time a meteor falls on the Earth and it has that structure and the iron... Um, most meteorites don't have that because most of them are the mm. stony type and it has to be the iron nickel type that has this pattern in it. Um, and all the iron nickel ones don't have this pattern. Some of them do and some don't. And this pattern, actually, these pieces were formed inside like a planet or a moon or some type of a body that had an iron core, a nickel iron core. Um, like the Earth has uh, an iron core, but it's not cooled down yet. As we have the magma and the heated mm -hmm. central yes. portion, portion of the Earth. But something like possibly the Moon and Mars may have done their cooling down completely and have a smaller uh, iron core within them. And if for some reason one of those bodies that had an iron core, a collision or whatever, broke that apart, fell on the Earth, and, um, and there's usually, they often break up, so there'll be several pieces, uh, many pieces. And this um, one from the Gibeons was found in Africa in 1836, but it's actually much older than that. Uh, it could be into the hundreds of thousands or million years old. And any one that is found from that particular fall will have a pattern just like this, where the angle between the different lines and the width of the lines will be the same. Um, those are called the Wiedenstatten uh, pattern from the guy who first told about those. And I have two examples here of Gibeon meteorites one of these was bought in, uh, purchased in a rock shop in California and another in Michigan. But we can tell that these patterns are the same, so we know that they both come from that Gibeon. We can tell by their fingerprint. Right, their fingerprint. Which exactly. Is, exactly. Now, the third type is actually a combination of the first two, Dave? Yeah, the third type is a stony iron. And the where that forms is around the core 
of the parent body, almost like the eggshell around the iron body. And as it cools, the, one of the first uh, minerals to solidify out of magma is olivine. And you can see the olivine in here. And as the light passes through it, it almost acts like, uh, I'd like saying it's like the stained glass of meteorites. It's the prettiest of the meteorites and it's the rarest form. They have, out of all the known meteorites, uh, they account for only about a percent and a half. That's not very many. No. So that's the combination of the, the previous two called stony irons. Correct. It has the iron matrix with the um, olivine crystals, which is the stone. Now the last type is called a tektite. Sandra, what about those? Yeah, they're actually not meteorites, but they come from meteorites. And How we, so? Um, when a, a large meteorite strikes the Earth, um, maybe the ones we're talking about, like a, a meteorite that landed and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, huge meteorite like this. Mm -hmm. When it lands on the Earth, the impact has so much energy from the speed and the size that it actually melts the dirt of the earth or the ground and splashes it up into space where it then gravity will pull it back down and it will cool and they tend to look like glass because the uh, and I think we have a example of this moldavite this is one of the types of tektites I have here and uh, they have lots of interesting little bubbles and you hold them up to the light and you can actually see through that they look like glass because of course we make glass from sand or silica and so this they'll have a translucent look like that. And uh, the Moldavite is the green type that we just saw and those uh, are believed to be about 700,000 years old and you can find those in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the other type I have here is an Indochinite, which um, the one I have here came from Thailand, but they're all about the area of Indonesia. Okay. And uh, although this one looks much darker and you don't really see the glass, the, the example I have here in my hand, it have some little thin parts towards the edge and uh, again, if I hold this up to a bright light source, I can see that it is, in fact, translucent. Well, this is all very interesting, the very various types of uh, meteors and meteorites that we have. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you have any questions about astronomy, please visit our website. You'll be able to uh, see the address there down at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we're going to go next to term of the month with Steve Weddy, and right after that, we'll be back with more about meteorites. The term of the month for March 2012 is extrasolar planet. Now, an extrasolar planet is a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. So this is something outside of our solar system. As of the middle of February 2012, 760 extrasolar planets have been confirmed. Now, when you, they're not very easy to spot, they're not very easy to find, and so you might have a detection of an extrasolar planet, but it really needs some uh, confirmation. Uh, you need a lot of data to really prove your case. And the reason why it's not easy to detect an extrasolar planet is that the star is about a million or more times as bright as the planet that you're looking for. And so it's a lot like looking for a firefly that happens to be right next to a searchlight. Now, direct imaging has been used to spot stars, uh, spot planets going around other stars, just a, f just a few times. Now, this image is from the Hubble Space Telescope. And in 2004, you can see in the inset on the right, uh, there's one image. And in 2006, you can see that the dot has moved, right? So they've, and then the little tiny square, that's, that's the big square that's, uh, you know, not blown up. 
In the center, you have a black spot, and that's the coronagraph on the Hubble Space Telescope. That's basically blotting out the bright central star. Uh, but they have put in a dot there that shows uh, where the star is. Uh, now, the very first planets were discovered not around sort of normal stars. They were uh, discovered around a pulsar. And uh, that was uh, done with radio telescopes. So a pulsar is a neutron star, and it has uh, a magnetic field that isn't at its uh, sort of its north pole. It's offset somehow. And uh, because of it, it shoots out a jet of radio waves our way. And as the neutron star rotates, the uh, uh, radio waves uh, sort of come at us in pulses. And uh, the timing of the pulses is very regular. And uh, subtle changes in the timings can betray the existence of planets orbiting the neutron star. In 1995, uh, we had the first confirmed discovery of a planet around a sun-like star. And this is 51 Pegasi. That's the name of the star. And it was uh, found using a technique called radial velocity. It turns out that with spectroscopy, you can tell the radial speed that is from our perspective here on Earth. You can tell how fast another star is either moving away from you or coming toward you. And as a planet orbits around a star, the star gets pulled either toward us, uh, toward the planet, or away from us, again, by the planet. And so the radial velocity technique, which has been used to find most of the uh, extrasolar planets that have been found, um, that was used to find a very big star, a big, very big planet, a Jupiter or bigger sized planet, in a very tight orbit, uh, tighter than uh, Mercury's orbit around our sun. The transit method is the second most uh, prolific uh, of the methods. Uh, and basically, here, what you're looking at is the brightness of the star. And if a planet comes between us and the star, then the star dims just a little bit. There is a satellite, the Kepler satellite. And it has uh, come up with 1,235 candidates by staring at 150,000 stars continuously from space. About half of the sun-like stars that we've looked at have planets. And that suggests that there are 160 billion planets in the Milky Way in our galaxy alone. Term of the month for March 2012 is Extrasolar Planet. Welcome back to our show. Now, Dave, Suppose I'm walking along somewhere, and I see a rock on the ground, and I pick it up, and I think it's a meteorite. How do I know that it really is a meteorite and just not some regular Earth rock? You know, that is the most popular question I get asked. And one of the things that draws our attention to the Earth rock, or to the, a particular rock, I should say, is it's the color, or something didn't look right with that rock. Uh, it may have a funny shape, or you picked it up to move it and it seemed heavy, or the color just didn't look right. And one of the things that you can look at, on the outside of the rock, a lot happens as this rock or the meteorite came through our atmosphere. The first thing, as Sandra was saying earlier about the meteorites, um, as it comes through our atmosphere, it starts to heat up. It hits a denser air, and as this denser air and the rock is traveling at such a high velocity, stuff's starting to melt, and it's being pushed away or bladed away. And these areas are called thumbprints or reglaments, and we can see them right in this rock here, and it's almost a feel to it. The other thing that happens to the ro uh, rock as it's coming through or the stone is the outside gets burnt, or it has a texture similar to an orange peel skin. It looks smooth, but it has a unique texture to it. Uh, the other thing that I tell people to look for is, uh, is 
if it is magnetic. About 90% of earth rocks are magnetic, and what I suggest is that you use a rare earth magnet versus a refrigerator magnet. Because your stone meteorites, since they're the co most common, they also have a, a large um, variety of metals associated with them. Some have a lot of iron to them, and some have very little. So a refrigerator magnet sometimes will, won't stick that well where your rare earth magnets stick very well. Okay, so that would be one test that a person that would do. be. Well, we've actually went through three. The touch, the reglaments, or the thumbprint. Is it magnetic? Uh, one of the other things is most people, um, when they see a stone that has holes in it, if it has holes in it, that's most likely not a meteorite because those are the weakest part of the stone. And as it was coming through our atmosphere, that would have been ablated away and actually turned into a thumbprint and not a hole. So that piece of slag that somebody finds and they think it's a meteorite, exactly. its very nature would say, no, it's not. Exactly. I mean, holes in the meteorite, um, you can almost look at a piece of slag and say, no, that's not a meteorite. Uh, one of the other things that I tell people to do if, after they pass some of the outside tests, is to make a little window in the stone to look on the inside to see what the inside is. And what we're looking for, again, are those chondrules where we want to see, is it iron? Um, is it, um, are there uh, the olivine crystals in it? Uh, so there's a lot that we can look at inside, but I don't, I tell people don't make cut the stone in half because that might damage it if it's a rare meteorite. Just make a little window. It's all we need to see inside. And this is something that they would have to take it to a, a rock store or, or s someone as yourself to be able to cut this window? Uh, uh, putting a window in a meteorite is fairly easy. All they take is some sandpaper and just grind it down to make a little window just about the size of a dime. It's all you need to look into it. So you don't need an it. expensive or fancy grinder, just nope. some sandpaper? or Just some sandpaper and a little bit of time, about 15 minutes to make a window. Okay. And with that, um, you know, uh, as I was saying, you know, some of the um, reglaments, some stones have a characteristic because since there's not a lot of temperature, um, since stone meteorites don't conduct uh, heat very well, your thumbprints are very shallow and very minor, where your iron meteorites can be very dramatic and easy to see. Because it would conduct heat more and thus... More heat get and, and be pushed away. More material being, being pushed away. Yep. So these are some basic tests that uh, people could do to uh, try to determine if they had a true meteorite. Uh, I suppose they could bring it to a natural history museum, perhaps, or some type of a science center. Someone there was an expert at this. Um, universities uh, will look at stones a lot. Uh, science centers. Um, you can go to rock shows. There's generally one or two people at rock shows will be able to tell if it is a meteorite. Um, but your most universities or community colleges, the geology departments, will look at them. All right. Well, this gives our viewers an opportunity to validate their stone to uh, be able to tell. Now, what can we learn from meteorites in, in terms of the big picture? Uh, what we learn is what happens to our Earth and how our solar system developed. The early ages, the building blocks of, these, of our Earth is actually this material. So this goes back really to as you say, the beginning of our solar system, as that giant yeah. cloud condensed out and... Uh, Ex exactly. It's almost like a CIS uh, show dating back billions of years. A 4.5 billion year years. old window into the formation of our solar system. That's uh, it's pretty heady stuff. Pretty heady yeah. stuff. Um, this has been great. Uh, I've learned an awful lot uh, from the two of you and uh, Certainly, 
I'm not an expert on everything in the show, and I certainly wasn't on this, so uh, I was an avid learner of all of the material that uh, the two of you have been able to uh, bring to our audience today. Um, is there some place where they can go to learn more? Uh, Sandra, anything that you can think of that uh, for our viewers? Um, the, of course, there's the internet. You can get a lot from there. Uh, I like to look at Wikipedia and some of the pictures came from there. Um, uh, libraries, uh, uh, how about you, Dave? Or another example would be an astronomy club. You could go to, if there's uh, our Ford Astronomy Club here in centered in the Dearborn area mm -hmm. in Michigan, and if you join in on a, an astronomy meeting, you could ask people there. All right, great. Also, they could see somebody at a rock show, too, I'm sure, right, Yep, Dave? yep, that's a good place to see them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our program here on Meteorites. If you have any questions about them or anything else, for that matter, you can send us an email. You can see the uh, address there down at the bottom of your screen. And right after our scroll of upcoming astronomy events here in southeast Michigan, we'll be back with Steve Witte with What's Up in the Night Sky for March. What's Up in the Night Sky for March 2012? Before we get to that, on March 10th, the Ford Club is having their annual swap meet. It's a great event. It's uh, something that you really should uh, get to if you can out on Six Mile. Uh, look up the Ford Club website for details. Now, the month starts with the f uh, first quarter moon absolutely on the first of the month. That's a Thursday. It's an evening object. A week later, we see the full moon up all night on the 8th. A week after that, on Thursday the 15th, is the third quarter moon. This is a morning object. You might see it on your way to work. The new moon is on the 22nd, uh, again, a Thursday. And then the month ends on the 30th with a first quarter moon again. Now, as the month rolls on, most objects rise about two hours earlier and set about two hours earlier than they did the previous uh, at the beginning of the month. So, uh, and that's for most objects, but there is an exception this month, which I'll get to shortly. Now, the last really easy way, e easy time to see Mercury happens at the beginning of this month. Just after the sun sets, look to where, about where the sun actually sets, uh, Mercury is 15 degrees above the horizon. That's about as high as it gets. And it sets about 8 p.m., and it's about as bright as Mars. Now, Uranus is not naked eye visible, but if you have binoculars or a telescope, it's just 4 degrees up and to the left of Mercury. Venus and Jupiter are incredibly bright, and they can't be missed. Jupiter is up and to the left of Venus. Uh, Venus sets at 10 p.m. Jupiter sets at 11 p.m. Now, Saturn doesn't rise until 10 p.m. It is a good, uh, a, a good thing to spot if you can uh, spot it. And the rings are, are great in a telescope. Now, Mars is on the other side of the sky. At, suns at sunrise, at sunset, Mars is in the east and it travels over to the west during the course of the night. Now, by the end of the month, sunset is at 8 p.m. Venus is above Jupiter and sets later than Jupiter does, breaking the rule that it sets later than it did, uh, that it sets earlier than it did at the beginning of the month. And Ju Venus and Jupiter pass on the 12th uh, at a very close three degrees. Mars is still up all night, but it's slightly in a different position, and Saturn rises much earlier at 8 p.m. And that's What's Up in the Night Sky for March 2012.